Good afternoon, everyone. Let me tell you something about myself. I am a card-carrying physicist. And I wouldn't say that unless I could back it up. Here it is, proof that I'm a member of the American Physical Society. <laughs> As a physicist, I've been trained in the tenets of science and natural philosophy. These tenets, the ability to use rational thought and experimental method to unravel the mysteries of nature, these tenets are something that I hold dear. They matter a lot to me, and I think they matter a lot to you also. Why do I bother telling you this? It's because I'm going to tell you about something for which I have no training whatsoever. And it's not going to be the first time in my life. I'm going to tell you about the metaphysical. I'm going to tell you about the paranormal. I'm going to tell you about the supernatural. I'm going to tell you a ghost story. Our story begins. Let's go way back in time to this character here, Democritus from Abdera. It is to Democritus that we ascribe the notion that nature was built of indivisible particles, which he called atoms. Now, we know nowadays that atoms are divisible, but he had the essential component of it right. There had to be indivisible particles. And somewhere, sometime, perhaps 500 years from now, physicists will get to that very bottom and will know what those particles actually are. Fortunately, we don't know today, so there's a little bit of job security for us. <laughs> Not bad. Right. What do we know about this character, Democritus? Amazingly, quite a lot, because he wrote quite a lot and he had quite a few students. It is passed down to us that he was a geometer, that he was a mathematician, a philosopher, and amazingly enough, a happy guy. He's the kind of guy that I would like to run into in some symposium and we could party afterwards. <laughs> Let's fast forward to just the early 1980s and these two characters here. Gerd Vinnig and Heine Rohr are my colleagues from um, IBM. They came up with a remarkable invention called the scanning tunneling microscope, which has revolutionized so many areas of physics and surface science, a little bit of chemistry, material science. This is an amazing instrument which takes a needle and can scan it over a surface and can provide us with atomic resolution images of surfaces. This is the kind of instrument that I fell in love with and use on a day-to-day -day basis. The incredible thing that atoms changed because of this instrument. They used to be remote, hard to get at, incredibly small. With the scanning tunneling microscope, atoms became large. They became visceral. They became stuff that we could get at in our laboratories and learn a lot because we could see where they were with respect to one another. and We could begin interacting with them. So it turns out that I had the very good fortune to be in a position where I was using a tunneling microscope and finding that so there would be things that we would do and the atoms would not hold still. Pesky little atoms, you think, you know, I'm a big scientist, I should be able to do experiments on them, but they would not hold still for me. So rather than fight it, I tried to understand why are they moving. It was because of the influence of this tip that I was bringing within a few atomic diameters of them. And I said, I think I can get that under control and use that to put atoms where I want them to go. What you see here is an image of a xenon atom on top of a platinum surface. The picture labeled before shows a xenon atom in one location and a dotted pathway from where it is located to where I wanted to put it using the tip of the tunneling microscope. And then the picture that's labeled after shows the atom where I wanted it to go. This is a control freak's paradise. <laughs> I can't tell you how much fun that was. It is fun still to this day. But I have to tell you, it's a little bit frustrating. Um, earlier today when we had our medical emergency and we needed a medical doctor, I really felt like, oh, I would love to be able to help that person, but I couldn't. So let me offer the best I can. If any of you have an atom out of place, come see me. <laughs> we'll work on it. It was not long after I moved that atom, atom number one, when I was sitting in my office late one night, and I remembered that Feynman had got interested about small structures and that he had written a paper about small structures and so I got the paper, and I started reading it, and I had a very eerie sensation. 
here comes the ghost story. Feynman was a pioneering spirit. We've seen many examples of that today. And he wrote this incredible paper called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And he published this. He gave a lecture here in 1959. It was published in 1960. A remarkably prescient paper. If you ever have the opportunity to pick it up and read it, do so. It is just plain fun. What I want to do is I want to read to you some of the words from that paper. Feynman wrote, but I'm not afraid to consider the final question as to whether ultimately in the great future we can arrange the atoms the way we want, the very atoms all the way down. What would happen if we could arrange the atoms one by one the way we want them? The principles of physics, as far as I can see, do not speak against the possibility of maneuvering things atom by atom. It is not an attempt to violate any laws. It is something in principle that can be done, but in practice it has not been done because we are too big. I heard those words, and I read those words, rather, and I got this incredibly eerie sensation. The hair on the back of my neck went sort of up, and I thought to myself, my God, you know, there's Feynman's in this room with me. Right? This is the ghost of Feynman. And if he was here, what would he say? What took you so long, kid? <laughs> okay, so we're slow. Where do we go from there? We went on to demonstrate that we really had control of atoms, that we could put them in controlled positions, one after another after another, that it wasn't a one-off kind of thing, that we really did have that control. That's what this thing accomplished. We got to Feynman's very bottom. We got all the way down. I got to tell you, um, it was just boggling to me to realize that by just good fortune and admittedly a little bit of hard work, I got to be the one to get to Feynman's bottom. Now, uh, <laughs> Consider the consequences. <laughs> where do we go from there? Well, if we can move atoms where we want, can we make the electrons do what we want? We found out under certain circumstances, yes, we could. We could engineer and build quantum states of electrons. What you're looking at there is a pool of electrons that have been trapped in this corral of iron atoms. And by putting these iron atoms in the positions where we wanted to, we could control the quantum states. We could shape the quantum states. We could adjust the energy levels of these quantum states. I told you I was a control freak. Keep that in mind. The haunting went on and on. Let me read to you another quote, again, from There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. So as we go down and fiddle around with the atoms, now you can just imagine Feynman fiddling around with little atoms somewhere. That's what I do, not what he did. So as we go down and fiddle around with the atoms down there, we are working with different laws, and we can expect to do different things. We can manufacture in different ways. We can use not just circuits, but some system involving the quantized energy levels or the interactions of quantized spins. Incredibly prescient words from that ghost of the past, from Richard Feynman. I've underlined three things there. Circuits, quantized energy levels, and quantized spins. Let me show you the prescient part of what Feynman said back in 1959. Circuits, yep, we've been able to build circuits, the smallest logic circuits. What you're looking at here is something called a molecule cascade circuit. It has another name, it's called a three input sorter. It has three logical inputs labeled A, B, and C over on the left side. Three logical outputs on the right side labeled um, 0, 1, which is logical AND, um, O, 3, output 3, which is logical OR, and output 2, which is a majority logic output. You don't need to know about that. It's made from 541 meticulously placed carbon monoxide molecules on a, car, on a copper surface. And it really does logic. And the most incredible thing about it is how small it is. At the time that we built this, this had an aerial density of 250,000 times better than state-of-the-art CMOS technology. Nowadays, it's no longer 250,000 times. Maybe it's only 10,000 times. But it is really small. That's circuits. What about quantized energy levels? We learned to pass around information in entirely new ways because we had control of those electrons. We could build quantum states where we could have two quantum states overlapping one another in space and then modulate one and get an answer over here but not affect the other one and then do the other one, allowing us to send two channels of information right through one another. That would be a huge step forward if we could harness that because we have a lot of information to move around and having wires not touch one another would be, or having to make wires not touch one another is painful and expensive and that's what we have to do today. 
quantized spins. This is what I really care about. Um, electrons are nice, but the great thing about them is they have spin. And that's what we want to harness to do computation in the future, is to use spins to do the computation. We're not there yet. We're on our way, but we've been able to learn an awful lot. Some of what I list in, in this slide here. We've been able to go to an individual atom and say, okay, Mr. Atom, tell us about your spins. The electrons that you've got, what are, they, what are their spins doing? We've been able to learn about the energy levels of the spins. We've been able to learn about the dynamic response of the spins. What happens when you give them a kick? How long does it take them to get back to their original state, to their so-called ground state? That's been really exciting, and it's very much a door for us to go through to get to that future where we do computation just with spins. So finally, I'd like to paraphrase Feynman um, and talk about where I think the future is going with spins and computation. Again, paraphrasing Feynman, what would happen if we could arrange the spins one by one the way we want them? The principles of physics, as far as I can see, do not speak against the possibility of maneuvering things spin by spin. This is not an attempt to violate any laws. It is something in principle that can be done, but in practice it has not been done. Why not? Because we're here at TEDx Caltech instead of in the lab where we really should be today. <laughs> right. And with that, and apologies to the ghosts, thank you very much. <laughs>